Well, I'll, I'm going to start. Thank you, Miles, for having this unique uh, moment um, for thinking of it. Miles contacted me um, a few months ago and pointed out how old we're all getting and the coincidence of these numbers and um, said that we should do something and we didn't know what it what it was meant to be exactly. But um, I I kind of threw it to Alex uh, Brooklyn and um, and she helped me give it some form by just talking about how we could hang out and talk and do something that would be um, that would make sense of the different signifiers, uh, Miles Bookshop and um, and and uh, Motherless Brooklyn being 20 years old and Chronic City being 10 years old, and um, we are also thinking a lot about um, a friend of ours who passed, uh, Michael Seidenberg of Brazen Head Books, and for me, all of these things are kind of woven together, and so I thought Alex would be especially capable of um, helping me. Uh, describe some of that if if she if she'd be willing to join me and so that that's lucky and um, and th yeah and uh, there's just a lot of different kinds of history uh, to remark on and um, I, and I also see a lot of personal history and friends of of mine and 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 family and Michael's friends and a, a circle of people that uh, gives me a a lot of courage and a sense of continuity. So thank you for turning up. Um, and I guess now I'm putting it in, in your hands. I mean, for me, um, actually hearing, I, I remember talking to you on the phone, actually hearing that it was the 20th anniversary of Motherless Brooklyn and the 10th anniversary of Chronic City, uh, I think for the first time in my life, made me pause about my own uh, age. <laughs> I Because I remember these these books, um, especially Butlerless Brooklyn and Fortress of Solitude, as I'm a teenager and then entering into my 20s being uh, extremely important for me, um, kind of like weaving the world I was trying to create with the world that I had heard about, with the world that was left in New York City, um, and kind of running through these three parallel times all through my life, um, and now my 30s, I was just taken aback with an actual timestamp. Um, and uh, I was excited to ask you just a slew of things about what your experience was like as a teenager in this city, as someone writing during the last 20 years, because they've kind of been a doozy. Uh, <laughs> A bit of a doozy in New York City. I guess the first thing I wanted to talk about was Michael. Michael Seidenberg. Um, <coughs> Michael Seidenberg was a friend of mine and a friend of yours. And he was a very particular kind of person in a city like rich with these particular kinds of people. And you first walked into his bookstore on Atlantic at bookstore slash puppet theater slash moving company in, uh, I'm going to get the year wrong, late 70s. 1978. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and what was that like? You were a kid. You were like 15. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I was actually 14 when I first met Michael and first walked into the, the shop. Um, and yeah, it's as, it's as much the story of my uh, coming of age as any other single event in a way it was the uh, the year my um, the year my mother died and short shortly after she died and I was still uh, rooted in Brooklyn I was be I was just beginning to kind of export myself on a daily basis on the a train up to uh, 135th Street um, at, to music and art high school back when it was there, kind of at, on the edge of the city college campus. Um, but I was still kind of a, a Brooklyn street kid, and um, and the neighborhood was, you know, I mean, it's it, it's almost indescribably different. The, the anecdote that Michael always used to repeat, which is a great emblematic one, was he, would, he was trying to describe where he'd come. So he'd, he'd come from Manhattan with this idea that uh, he should put a used bookstore somewhere, and he found it a cheap enough storefront to have one 
and it, and it was a puppet theater and a moving company as well. And um, but he was when people got to know Brooklyn as it changed, and they were like, oh, Atlantic Avenue, that would be a good place to have a bookstore. He was trying to explain what it was like in 1978 when he attempted this, and he said, you know, pe- plumbers would rent out storefronts just to keep their tools in on Atlantic Avenue back then because it was so inexpensive. And, and the ones that didn't have plumber's tools in them were just empty. And there were four or five antique stores. There was this weird old cluster of antique stores, one, or, one of which I think is actually called In Days of Old, is miraculously still continuously uh, there. But they, they were an anomalous thing. And the rest of the, that street and the rest of Borm Hill and downtown Brooklyn were, you know, as, as you encounter them in – uh, you know, documentaries about the blackout, for example. It was just a, it was a part of the city that was more or less redlined and 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 um, written off. Uh, and um, I mean, I think uh, th- it was an open question whether you know, like a, f- a fire engine would come if you called in a fire back then. And Michael, I don't know what memo he'd gotten that he should try to have a bookstore on that street, but his friend Larry Fantle who was the, his partner in the puppet theater, had arranged to get the storefront, and Michael moved all his books into this space, and his friend Bob Barnes helped convert, create uh, these um, these bookshelves that could be converted into a puppet theater <laughs> at a moment's notice. And so I became, instantly, I walked in, and there were these charismatic, weird, pot-smoking guys in their 20s who just converted me into their instant apprentice in all of these different guilds. So I became the manager, the, the stage manager of the puppet show, uh, which mainly meant, you know, I was like run up and set off a flash pot at a certain point in, in during the show. And, and I became the, uh, the, the third wheel on the moving company, which was a very rinky-dink moving company. Larry had a kind of a, a parcel truck. It looked like a U.S. mail truck painted uh, – some kind of neutral color, and then of course graffitied, heavily graffitied at all times, and um, and it was called L and L Movers, and the the uh, he actually Larry had a business card printed up that said L and L Movers, uh, uh, no job too small, some jobs too large, <laughs> that he could hand out, and um, and we would go and move people in and out of apartments, and uh, a couple of times we moved pianos or couches up on pulleys, winches. I remember in Park Slope, standing in the middle of the street, like stopping traffic and pulling, trying to pull a piano up to a window. Um, and um, But the main thing I did was I became absorbed in Michael's uh, profession, his real profession. And, and, you know, it's one of the things I like to talk about. It's so easy to think about Michael in terms of his uh, anomalous, bon vivant kind of, you know, his, the extraordinary nature of his personality and that space he created, uh, the, the famous secret bookstore, Brazenhead Books. But he was also, he was a real bookman. I mean, he really came out of a, a, of a guild and, an, a, you know, a real deep tradition and a way, of, a practice of uh, finding, you know, scouting and, and identifying and valuating books. And, and, he, he was, and he immediately understood that I had some sort of weird... Uh, appetite to, to understand this world, and so he 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 began to teach me. I almost don't pull those two things apart because his words and the ob- obsession, the, the the love of of books, not just you know books, which is one thing I want to ask you about, like what books mean in their actual as uh, the relationship people have with them as objects, but also that he would be able to express the excitement. Like it was, th- it was yeah. w- the people he would meet were excited about the same things in the same way, and it was with that that he could find that common language to make him charismatic. Would Michael have been as charismatic? Would these like? I think of him as this gatekeeper of culture, this person that came to usher uh, people into an entirely new slew of worlds, and if they didn't have the interest. Would he have seemed so grand to them? Uh, his the I remember reading Motherless Brooklyn years later, meeting Michael and him explaining that uh, I- him explaining at some point 
how he knew you and um, why he had so many of your books around. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember going, that makes sense. Uh, the, the Tourette's, it makes <coughs> sense. Just the flood of words and words mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, Motherless Brooklyn, to me, I was always curious because that was 1999. It was published in 99, yeah. And it's, this is so, this is before 9-11. Giuliani is mayor. Um, the city is like on a cusp of just getting rid of some crime. Like what, at that time, it's a detective story, and at that time, what is your influence like? What were you nostalgic for in 1999? Yeah. Well, so the, the has so many things to talk about. Uh, <laughs> it's really overwhelming. <laughs> and I want to talk about how Michael f f funds that character and that image and the, the book. But let me talk about uh, the origin story of, of my, you know, getting to the, the, the idea about Brooklyn that, that, that forms that book. I'd been living in California. I'd run away to the Bay Area. And I didn't think I wanted to be a New Yorker anymore. I I'd had a very extraordinary but very conflictual uh, life growing up uh, in Brooklyn and, um, and also really felt like I needed distance from it. I mean, this is something I think Miles can relate to. You know, we both, after college, you know, we, in New England, uh, where we met, we went to the Bay Area, and I, you know, he was another New York kid and it was you know growing up here in the 70s and 80s was amazing and and you know that city that's now kind of consecrated in like patty smith's memoirs and uh you know documentaries about cbgb or whatever it was incredible i you know and i have a lot of i i, I brag about it all the time but also i felt i was in the cr crosshairs or under under the thumb of the city in many ways it was over stimulating and and um incomprehensible and my place in it was very hard to measure or or feel secure in so I, I wanted distance from it and I'd been away for a long time and then I came back in a hurry and one of the main reasons I came back was for pe specific people I wasn't thinking I need to reconnect with New York City or you know now I need you know I'm gonna be like the boy who makes good and I'm gonna make the city my own I just wanted to see certain people my family but Michael especially and I, every time I traveled back to New York City in in my 20s when I was living in Berkeley and San Francisco I always stayed at you know 80, 84th Street I stayed at what other people came to know as Brazen Head and I would sleep in that back room the tiny one that had the rare books in it <laughs> and that was my bedroom in New York because my father had moved to Maine by this point I didn't have any other bedroom in New York and I started to realize I, I just needed to see the people that I loved in New York again and I had published three novels, and I was able, in a kind of a scuffling way, to quit my bookstore job in, in Berkeley, where I was working at Moe's. So I was free and easy, and I got a cheap apartment in, in Greenpoint and, um, and, and started living in New York City again. And then the memory door opened. There was something about being on the streets in Brooklyn. Suddenly, I was thinking about it and falling in love with it and responding to it. And, um, and the first thing I did was write this kind of valentine. I mean, Mother's Brooklyn's a very, uh, you know, it's, it's a very sentimental book about Brooklyn. And, that, and then behind that layer, you know, where I kind of turned it into a, a, a delicious confection, came all the capacity, I think, to feel the deeper, more conflictual things, and I write, and then I write Fortress of Solitude, which is the book that really is much more, uh, lays bare all of my, um, the intricacies of being in this place for me, and coming from this place. But the first flush, you know, in 97, when I moved back, I'm like, wow, I, I'm of this place, but I've been denying it, I've been holding it at bay, the language is so extraordinary of the streets, the richness of encounters, and now I can, I can, let it back in, and so this image of you know the ki the kids in Motherless Brooklyn and Frank Minna who adopts them and the way he shows them Court Street in that world of Carroll Gardens, you know was was just me um, mythologizing my own responsiveness to to the um, New York vernacular energy.
Um, the creation of, also the creation of that mythos building on past genre. I mean, Motherless Brooklyn is a detective story. It's a noir. You kind of continue that and build on it with Fortress of Solitude. Now, a lot of people call or just keep referencing Fortress of Solitude as like magical realism. And I read something, I read an interview where you kind of eschew that mm. uh, notion. Uh, <laughs> to me, the ring, the ring in the story um, and the idea that there is some kind of escape I, I could only imagine that that escape was uh, words and conversation. And, you know, this ring shows up during, like, these moments of uh, intense connection between a lot of the characters. And I always assumed that that somehow tied into this conversation culture and this mm. network of people like Michael. Uh, when I was a teenager, I had a, a s someone like Michael. His name was Tim, and he lived around the corner. Um, and he was older, and we, you know, dropped acid and walked around Times Square. And I think he's the person that introduced me to Cronenberg. And these just worlds opened up for me. And there, I found out that there was this network of these conversational kind of ne'er do wells, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that the art and act of talking could just open up so much. Later, when I read Chronic City, it just felt like my my head kind of cracked open. It was at a moment where I had seen a lot of this culture leaving, just going away, and I was trying to hold on to it because I felt like I had just gotten there, that when I, what I did w as a kid was just kid stuff. And then you're writing about these incredible people that sat cross-legged on their living room floor and were emblematic of of salon culture and of books and this appreciation, just as cell phones are coming in 2009, cell phones are coming in, uh, there's a transition between the tactile world and the digital world. And um, and I just wanted to, like, how did your nostalgia change between what you were nostalgic for kind of in, uh, while you're writing Motherless Brooklyn and then what happened while you're writing Chronic City? And that 10 years in this city uh, was so, so transitional, yeah. so transformative. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's almost an unbridgeable gulf. Well, you know, when you think about it, that ten years. Um, and I mean, th that's so. That's the ten years of my, the substantial adult living in New York City again. You know, and it's not that long after Chronic City that I moved to where I live now, back in you know in California. And, um, and in a way, they record a kind of disenchantment, but also a, 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 a desire. I mean, Chronic City is about wanting to find the world underneath the world, wanting to find the city hiding still inside the city, which is, you know, what uh, used bookstores were for me as a kid, this bohemian demimonde of possibilities. My parents were, you know, they, they belonged to this place, but not in the sense that they could quantify or possess it or, or triumph. It was just, it was conversational. It was a, 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 a world of... Uh, you know, political activists, artists, um, and you know, young. You know, my 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 parents had what was essentially a commune, and we would have you know young NYU grads or my father's uh, renegade art students from Kansas City who dropped out of college to avoid the draft, and you know, gone to Canada and then snuck back into the U.S. and and then as he got involved with uh, Quakerism and political activism. We would have all these international people living in our house um, that were, uh, you know, part of a network, uh, a thing called the American Friends Service Committee, which basically would just find beds for international dissidents to crash in. So like a, a young Okinawan, basically, you know, uh, you know, kind of a, a bomb thrower, someone who'd been, been throwing Molotov cocktails at the American... Uh, you know, military base on Okinawa, you know, and, and he'd be, like, part of our family for a while. And, and, um, and this sense that the city was a place where there were these secret histories and networks, and I was still trying to kind of prove that they existed in, in Chronic City. You know, but I'm also very conscious of the uh, improbability by that time, the, the, the sense that they're all imperiled, that they're being priced out. And so 
you know, the Perkis Tooth apartment is like a magical space where this is still true, as Michael's bookshop was, for so many people, uh, evidence, you know, and, and, you know, not alone. You don't want to ever claim that they're, that's the only uh, place where the energy field is still locatable. It's where you find it. It's where you make it. You know, M- Miles is keeping this, you know, Miles and Jonas are keeping this one alive. Any, you know, for me, any bookstore has that potential to generate that kind of meaning. And, and there are so many different kinds of life still in the city. You never want to fall into some generalization. But I'll risk a few. <laughs> you know, in a way, it's very hard to recapture, and it sounds very um, mawkish and politically naive, but there was something about the immediate aftermath of 9-11 that was very uh, extraordinary. There was a sense of community, and this is the thing that Rebecca Solnit now describes so adeptly in How in Disaster we don't, you know, it turns out we don't go into a bunker mentality and begin, uh, you know, um, killing one another. Sometimes the police decide that that's what's going on, as they did in New Orleans. But what neighbors tend to do is actually suddenly see one another and form communities of acknowledgement and, and, and mutual aid. And, um, and there was this, you know, uh, unbelievably fragile, as it turns out, moment when New York saw itself as vulnerable and therefore you know, a lot of the energy field kind of uh, seemed very alive. You could just go om- nearly anywhere in the days and even the weeks immediately after, and people were afraid, and there was, you know, I can't go in the subway, there might be an envelope of white powder on the subway station or something, but there was also intimate connection. There and was also, uh, I mean, people people waiting, I remember, on the street when you couldn't go below uh, yeah, Houston Street. Of course. They would wait for the volunteers yeah. to come up and walk up 6th Avenue, and they would cheer for yeah. th- um, yeah. anyone who was walking up. It also seems so strange now. But then, of course, the narrative was captured on behalf of a monstrous, you know, international crimes. And, 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 and I felt, you know, in a way that New York fell silent in, in, uh, in bitterness and, and confusion at, at the u- usurpation of this. The pain became a, a, a flag that was being waved around for, for, to, for doing all this unbelievably destructive stuff and changing our world in so many ways that are so, so regrettable and so confusing to even still try to unpack. Um, and then... In some ways, and again, these generalizations are really (laughs) ridiculously broad, but there was this moment when the uh, the story under, you know, the Giuliani administration and the 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 Bush administration and was we're back, and what they meant was like Wall Street was back. It was a money city again, and that was supposed to be the form that the healing took, and we weren't going to think about. You know, and it was all you had was like a, a few, you know, never forget bumper stickers on the, on the, you know, cars or, you know, on the fire stations, and then you had a city that just sealed up into this, you know, um, at some levels, the the official definition of the city was the engine of capitalism again, and and triumphalist capitalism. There was a money party that got thrown instead of thinking about history or or c- complicity it became and that's why i made up that war free edition of the new york times for, for conic city because i was like people are just can't even think about what happened they can't think about the trauma that they felt and how it got usurped and it's just uh hey we're riding high uh just don't look at that section of the paper where 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 the nightmares are happening and there was a moment when there was literally a warship that got uh, made out of the metal that was melted in in new jersey from the towers, and it was like we are literally going to float the like the materials of your misery out across the ocean and kill people with it now. So that's going to be really good. And they paraded this warship around Manhattan Harbor. I mean, you know, right Battery City. You could look at it before it sailed off for the Middle East. And I felt a kind of this grotesque sense of uh, how much of a shroud of uh, amnesia had fallen 
in the in the city, and so that was this this fog that I had in closing the city in Chronic City, uh, and then you know, so then the life of the the conscience becomes um, you know a, like a a secret from itself. I think a lot of people think about uh, as you said, you know, uh, we're back, capitalism is back. You know, the the city just balloons, rents balloon and. Uh, not that they hadn't before, but instead of spaces just becoming more expensive, um, something that I wanted to talk about in Chronic City was uh, the character of Perkis too, mm -hmm. and um, you know who's based on uh, a conglomerate of a couple <laughs> people, uh, but these kind of people who um, were also mentally ill, but also were able to survive in a city. So it's not just the the storefronts and it's not just the spaces, but it's also the ability for a certain kind of people to thrive in a conversational culture. One of the one of the people that uh, Perkis Tooth is based on is um, uh, someone that Michael also knew very very well, and for someone like Michael to exist uh, as not to like over sanctify Michael because you know he was an awesome guy that drank late and <laughs> talked about all manner of things, but he also was incredible at helping people, bringing people into his home. And there's not the ability, uh, it just seems like with the rent and with the money, there isn't the ability for people like Michael or like Paul to exist in this city anymore without intense amounts yeah. of capital. Well, it certainly, uh, Paul seemed to me uh, like a a ghost in in the in the machine of the city at that time, and he was a ghost in the in the story of his own life as well. Um, Paul Nelson, so a very quick sketch, was um, a a music journalist who was who grew, who uh, wrote about folk music and founded a tiny little a great early music zine called the Little Sandy Review in um, in Minnesota, and he grew up. He was a high school friend of Bob Dylan's, and actually, if you if you ever look at No Direction Home, the Scorsese documentary about uh, about Dylan, and and in the section about Dylan as a aspiring and obnoxious uh, you know college kid, uh, Paul Nelson is in it explaining how Bob one day came and stole his record collection, and. Um, but they were sort of friends, and they and and Paul was recognizing what Dylan was accomplishing, and they came to New York at the same time during that folk boom, and Paul worked for wrote for uh, I think for uh, Sing Out or Folkways, I'm not sure which one it was, one of the two dominant New York-based folk music zines, and then he was the one guy in that scene who, uh, when Dylan went electric, didn't denounce it, but said actually I think that's good and I'm going to follow him and he ended up writing for Rolling Stone and writing about a lot of things and was a good friend of Lester Bangs and and had a, a a moment when he was one you know he was part of the what you might call the kind of the founding generation of the 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 rock critic you know uh established what's become the rock critic critic establishment Grill Marcus and 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 um Chris Gow and uh Alan Willis and and Lester Bangs and he was part of that gang but he was also a a stranger, shyer, and slightly older man than that. He wasn't as much of a. He, he wasn't. He wasn't as ready to hang out at like Jan Winter's parties and thrive. And he he eventually fell out of that world. And that's when I got to know him in Michael's bookshop. He was just a perfect example of what would happen if you walked in the doors. And this was in the era when Michael's shop was a walk-in, a street-level walk-in bookshop on 84th Street, a few blocks away from the apartment. Uh, it became a laundromat. I, it, I worked at seven different used bookstores as a teenager, and at some point, every one of them was turned into a laundromat. <laughs> I, and I'm really not kidding. It was like, that was the format. You know, eventually this will be a laundromat. Um, there was one on, on, in Brooklyn on Clinton Street on the way to Brooklyn Heights between um, Girolamin and Remsen. It was, also, it was like Michael's. It was a little walk-down, and then it became a... Remsen Street Books became a, um, a laundromat, too. I wrote about that bookshop in uh, a, a piece about meeting the writer Herbert Hunky there. He used to come in, and um, he, would sign, he would sell autographed Allen Ginsberg books that were inscribed to Herbert Hunky, which were like a valuable 
Beat Generation Association copy, and he would sell them to us so that we could sell them. But then when they weren't selling, he would come in and shoplift them so that he could sell them back to us. And he had this box of them in his, in his basement, and he was just cycling them through the shop. Um, but so I walked in when I was in my college years, and I wasn't seeing Michael all the time. But I, when I was in New York, I would hang out there, and there was a, a guy who'd sort of taken over from me as his you know, right hand, his young apprentice, was a, 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 another young bookseller named David Breithaupt, who many of you will have heard referred to as Bats Breithaupt, if you hung out with Michael. And there are, there's artwork by Bats all over the apartment, mostly drawings of Bats. <laughs> and, um, but so, uh, you know, the thing about Michael was he was incredibly industrious and incredibly lazy. He always needed someone to open the shop for him because he was sleeping in. So it used to be me in Brooklyn, and then it was Bats in, on the 84th Street shop. And I would walk in there, and Paul Nelson would just be sitting in the corner. And I would get in this conversation with this kind of dusty figure. I mean, he was probably only in his late 40s, younger than I am now at that time. But Paul had this – he was like a Bartleby the Scrivener. He would dropped out of reality. And, and yet he had this – unerring interest in certain things and obsessive consuming interest in certain things. And one of the things that we connected on immediately was Philip K. Dick, who Paul had discovered. And Paul didn't want to talk about rock and roll or folk music. You know, you would try to get these stories about Bob Dylan out of him, and he was just, he wanted to talk about Chet Baker and Philip K. Dick, and (laughs) Ross MacDonald was a giant obsession of his. And he led me down these wonderful rabbit holes. And in a way, my first novel, Gun with Occasional Music, which is a very deliberate attempt to to put... Philip K. Dick together with the hardball detective story was almost like a tribute to Paul's influence on me, his reading and taste. And, um, but yeah, Michael was taking care of him. And Michael took care of him for 30 odd years. And, and, and we would, he, you know, Paul came out of his apartment less and less often. I mean, for a while, it's interesting, he, and no one knew his, his backstory, he was working at the counter of a video rental, a VCR, a VHS uh, rental place on Bleecker Street. And people would go in and talk with Paul Nelson, and he would have all this movie knowledge, and he would he would re- recommend movies to them. And they had no idea that they were talking to a guy who had once been this kind of influencer, right, who had, who had written, you know, who had interviewed, you know, Linda Ronstadt for Rolling Stone magazine. It was just a guy. He was a clerk at a, 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 a video shop. And, but eventually, he couldn't even handle that anymore. And he was in his apartment, and the only person he would see was Michael. And Michael would sometimes lure him out, and I would see him briefly in Michael's apartment, and Paul would just sit there, and I would sort of try to catch the old threads, you know, let's talk about Chet Baker, or what are you reading lately? And he just could barely do it. And Michael would say, one day I'm going to go up there to, to, to bring some food and, and pocket money to Paul, and he's going to be dead in that apartment, walled in by his books and his carefully hand-lettered VHS tapes that he dubbed off of PBS. You know, he had this ridiculous collection of, of movies that he treasured uh, before there was a Criterion collection. It was the Paul Nelson collection. I still have a couple of these video cassettes. And sure enough, you know, one day Michael, who was the only person who was looking out for him, went up there and Paul was dead behind his, his wall of books. So that was the Perkis Tooth image in some ways. Uh, yeah. Um, to bring it into, uh, into context... Rent control and and rent stabilization has almost been a uh, a subsidy of artists and thinkers, <laughs> um, not just the artist housing, not just uh, the artist housing that was built in Greenwich Village or in Midtown Manhattan, and um, with all of that kind of going away, as landlords have been able to erode them, they've enacted laws this year that are trying to preserve some of those. Um, rent regulated spaces but it's almost like they're too late and i wonder if a man like michael or a woman like michael or uh um paul nelson these people that had these that were allowed to have these hideaways um and allowed to have these like treasure troves of items would be able to survive in a contemporary new york and where can those spaces now be created without immediately being branded or have to be branded by bringing in like commercial profit is just something that started you know circling around my head as I was reading up about Paul um, in preparation for this Mm -hmm. and and one of the things that was so special about Michael 
Um, and I didn't know Paul, but I assume about him was it, the relationship with these physical objects that are books. Yeah. And you have written in an era where literally the written word is going from tangible and this incredible relationship with an object in physical space that people love and they have the smell of books, the mustiness of it, the dust in Michael's apartment that eventually started making me cough um, once I realized it I, uh, wasn't just cigarettes. And... Um, <laughs> And, and how that's like changing into the digital sphere. And there's a scene in Chronic City that I kept going back to where, uh, I hope I pronounce it right. I've never actually said this word out loud. Uh, Chaldron. Chaldron, yeah. Chaldron. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. the Chaldron <laughs> and uh, Biller. And him explaining to Ula, who is the character in the book that's a ghostwriter, and um, Perkis Tooth and Chase, he explain trying to explain to them how he makes real money out of the um out of the virtual world mm -hmm. and how he starts as just like a guy who uses a cell phone downstairs from uh like with a wire running on a laptop downstairs from Perkins's apartment by creating these things and now he has a new coat and he can support himself um and that that transition what he's describing to them is essentially sims what what now many yeah. people I know are, are very familiar with, which is like uh, Sims and people pay for items in those worlds with with physical money or I guess I I don't know enough about cryptocurrency <laughs> to uh, have that enter into the conversation yeah. confidently. But, you know, yeah, well, I, I think that I have a really ambivalent fascination with the virtual object because it's it's I mean, the children's in the in the book. I hope it's like a multiply resonant symbol, both of the the phantasmic, you know, uh, idea of the commodity, you know, I mean, uh, that, that you sell the allure, you sell the, you know, what's the cliche, the sizzle, not the steak, uh, that, that, um, you know, or, or to put it in like Lacanian terms that the lack, you're selling the, the desire itself for, uh, the, the endlessly replenishable, totally elusive experience of, acquiring a thing or 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 wanting to acquire a thing or or participate in something but also you know art itself is a kind of a a virtual object right i mean the novel i'm very attached i do have this deep body sense that the book is this um you know companion and you know also in these celebrations and we're in one it's so fantastic people are always talking about like the individual book like it's an object, you, it's better than the Kindle, and uh, you know I, I can I can get very seduced by this description of the the heft and the physicality of an individual book, but the description I hear less often that you know so meaningful to me, and it's so implicated in Michael and 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 you know what M Miles and Jonas created here, the room full of books, the space where you walk in and you're surrounded as if ent entering a kind of a, a a hologram of potential. Uh, resonating mysteries, you know, things, you could never read them all, you, you want to read them all, you don't know where to go, you don't know what lies behind these different things, you know, the, the space that is a room full of books is as meaningful a physical, tangible, um, uh, you know, um, compulsion well, for the me auditory as, yeah the, just the fact that there's dead and sound in the room yeah. um can be so That's alluring there's a quietness uh -huh. that is allowed and a, yeah. and the conversations are are more pleasant uh, <laughs> it, just just on a purely like uh, auditory level when you mentioned philip k dick so reading philip k dick there's it's almost impossible in this era not to see that it was extremely predictive a lot of his novels mm -hmm. you know world that jones built um i could name a bunch of others but they're escaping me <laughs> uh but in chronic city that conversation with biller seemed to me now that i go back and i reread it incredibly predictive as far as the world that now is based on influencers and mm. uh, a strange strange virtual cachet yeah. and that people like our, our people like Perkis Tooth and our spaces in real time and like in physical reality on their way out for things like, you know, cultivated yeah. 
virtual world. But I think everything creates the appetite for, for its opposite. I mean, it's very, very strange. I remember I once, uh, I was at a science fiction convention, and I sat in the, this giant auditorium. The guest of honor was Barry Malzberg, who <laughs> was a very Perkis Tooth-like figure, uh, very, very mordant, and, and, uh, and he... he He'd, you know, he'd written dozens and dozens of novels. And anyway, it was a giant, there was like 400 people there sitting there, and he was speaking to them in this, in this uh, unbelievably grave tone. He said, I am forgotten. No one cares. It never happened. I might as well have never written them. And every, you know, 400 people were like, yes, we hear you, Barry Malsberg. You are forgotten. You know, and <laughs> here we are. I mean, we're, we're sitting here right now tangibly embodying the, the paradox that, Yes, we live in this like incredible uh, atmosphere of, pr of of projections and illusions and, um, and 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 the manipulation of our desire by this uh, terrifying set of systems, new 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 operating systems, these codes, and yet we also, you know, I mean, Michael got famous in New York City for having a place basically where you know old books and whiskey and conversation. <laughs> was happening. And so, you know, just as I think, you know, the, the fragmentation of our attention spans creates a, a deep allure for the exactly the experience of a long, impossible novel that you can't fathom its edges when you're inside it. It's so immersive. You know, there is this beautiful uh, intricacy of and, 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 and counter um, response. I don't want to call it even a reaction. I think it's just a response that that um, people find nourishment, you know, uh, in in um, in one another and in the in these these practices, and and the two things, you know, fund each other and colonize each other in weird ways. I mean, that was in a way one of the things that I I wanted to write about the screen life in Chronic City a little bit, but I I knew that just like I've often the only way I can write about something that really leaves me completely feeling helpless. Like the way I wrote about physics and Ashley climbed across the table was to write from the point of view of someone who didn't get it, who couldn't understand the first thing about the, the you know, uh, the, the, the uh, paradoxes of that light can be both wave and particle. He's like, stop. I can't hear that. It's too crazy. So by writing about it from the most innocent, naive point of view, I mean, in some ways, it's what I did with, this, with the descriptions of Brooklyn. Lionel is an e eternal innocent in regards to Brooklyn. It made it gave me a vehicle for talking about it, and that opened the door to thinking uh, it, about stuff that was impossible for me to think about. Well, with the screen life, you know, those moronic scenes in Chronic City where they're just trying to win a eBay auction. I was yeah. like, forget <laughs> about real virtuality. Just just try to like win a bid. You know, they, they, their, their pulses are pounding and they're like, oh my God, we're going to get the children. And then somebody else sweeps in at the last second and they've lost. And, it's, and they're devastated. And it's like, did something happen? Were we in a store? Did someone steal from us? <laughs> like, what was that? But these things are enmeshed now, you know? I mean... They weren't so much for Michael. <laughs> I remember one of my last conversations yeah. with him. I was trying to impress upon him how amazing... Um, the, my discovery that there were different kinds of Twitter mm -hmm. and, and trying to walk him through what that <laughs> meant, that yeah. there was uh, Twitter, but then I had found out there was sex Twitter, but there was also black Twitter, and trying to really just, uh, just walk him through the different layers and slices and That's almost right. realities that yeah. existed in this like strange virtual space and at a certain point which i had never seen him do he kind of just laughed and threw up his hand and goes i don't tweet <laughs> i i don't tweet <laughs> um and it would ha happen once in a while if i got too uh passionate or emphatic about a point um, and tried to show him too many times how to do something on a computer. Yeah, his his stubbornness was epic. <laughs> it was it was it was an art form. Um, well, so um, I got it. I mean, it was be so it's so tempting to talk about Michael forever, and I and I and I also you know I want to reminisce a little bit about um, about this shop and Miles, our the trajectory of you know. Oh yeah, you said you had a story. Well, you know when we. When I got to Bennington College, which is a, a, a complicated 
juncture that I've I've mythologized in print a few different times. But one of the weird things was there were you know I felt like an outlaw or a or a a spy in this world of privilege that I'd accidentally catapulted myself into. And also, like, I'd made a fatal mistake. Like, I was, it was arrogant of me to think I was going to be okay there because everyone was just exchanging stories about, um, you know, where they were going to spend their next holiday. And the names were, like, literally place names I'd never heard of and thought were fictional, like Moustique or Steamboat. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm going to, like, hitchhike back to Brooklyn and, like, have, you know, turkey at my stepmom's house. And, and, you know, it just I realized I was in I was way in over, over my head and and um, but there were a few other, you know, scoundrels who'd slipped <laughs> under the <laughs> under the, uh, you know, who and 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 Miles was another um, New York kid. And and we I didn't trust you at first because it was like you might know too much about where I was from and what I was trying to pull off by being in the, existing in that environment. But I remember being on the basketball court and you did like a certain kind of head fake and I was like, oh no, it's a schoolyard move. That's not, that's not, that's not okay. You know, like I can run around these prep school guys, but he's, he, he's got, he's got a schoolyard move. And, um, and then, and we both ran away to the Bay Area and you, you know, so slow down. Okay. Yeah. Well, I dropped out. You, you, somehow you survived. All the, I didn't graduate. You didn't? Oh, okay. We have that in common. Yeah, I only lasted three semesters at, at, at Bennington, but um, I used it for some important work. I mean, it, it, it still was really formative, and I even had, I made lifelong friends, and I even had encounters with some of the professors that were crucial to me. But I also, the whole time I was rejecting it, or, or I was in a kind of uh, ab reaction. I was so upset at what I was learning at all at once about privilege and, you know, I I'd existed in a kind of time warp. My parents were keeping the s '60s, or if not the '60s, the early '70s, alive in our home and in the neighborhood of Brooklyn, where there were all these communes, and and and, you know, uh, roll up the rug, you know, uh, druggy communist dance parties, and then suddenly I'm like, in one giant, you know, error. I've moved into the Reagan 80s. And, and uh, everything I cared about was, it turned out it was like 10 years in the rearview mirror. And I was just getting that memo all at once. And I think you and I had that sort of in common too because of your, the, the bohemian milieu of your, your dad's gallery and his friends. Um, so, you know, all the signifiers, I was like trying to talk to them about like a Richard Brodigan novel. And they were like, <laughs> that's like, if we've heard of it, it's so embarrassingly out of fashion. You know, <laughs> we're we're reading Raymond Carver now, and just stop. Don't do that. Uh, and um, you know, it was also Michael's world that was unrecognizable to 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 this place that I'd come. But um, you know, and I I was very I was very pointed. I had this pattern. So I said I, I worked at seven or eight little used bookstores. I kept trying to repeat the pattern of walking into Michael's. That was my children. That was my unreachable object. So I thought I thought any, you know, New York was full. If a, if a plumber could afford to rent a, shore, a storefront for their tools, you could also afford to have a used bookstore. And there were a lot of moldering, very, you know, doing very little business kind of used bookstores that were just basically like all about to evaporate. And there, were, there were some that had a lot of history. There was one in Brooklyn Heights that um, had famously had um, H.P. Lovecraft's papers hidden in the basement somewhere, but no one was allowed to go down there because the guy was too grumpy. And so H.P. Lovecraft scholars were all trying to like get into his basement. And I used to go and I tried to apprentice myself to every one of these dudes. And they were, none of them were like, you know, the children. Michael was the only one who, who, who became a kind of a, a way of life for me. But I, I even tried to repeat that in Bennington. There was this used bookstore down by near where the old factory was. And I walked in several times and I was like, and it was a fairly young guy, but he had the grumpy, defeated used bookstore vibe. And, <laughs> I, and I kept saying, I'll work for books. You know, I was like trying out my magic formula that it worked with Michael. I, I just want to be in the shop and work for books. He was like, I don't need anybody. <laughs> no, 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 here I am. I'm like the book kid. You're going to adopt me now. And he wouldn't, he just wasn't having any of it. 
That might have kept me in college if that guy had let me work in his used bookstore. Um, so where was I? <laughs> Yeah, I go out west. I can't reproduce this whole. You guys are being very patient. Some of you are standing. Maybe I should keep the promise to read a little bit. Oh, we can and keep we, the promise okay. to read. Yeah. Um, but the uh, and then we're gonna we're still gonna do some questions. We're gonna open it up to. We questions. can open it up to questions. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do that after you read? Is that that's okay? I think that's good. Okay. I think a lot of yeah. people want to hear. Great. Um, Thank you. I'll, so okay, I'm gonna set this up as briefly as possible. This is the f this is the. I read it once to people who didn't understand what I was reading because I was in um, Florence, and they were very, they were very, they were very kind. So I, I read, I read a, a tiny, tiny piece of this book to some people in Florence at a writing school there. Um, but you're the first people who, um, who, who will probably be able to uh, make any sense of it, if if that, if if that's possible. This is a a, a very problematic sequence of pages from a novel that I'm writing that I'm excited about that's got a lot of uh, a lot of conflicts have emerged in my revision process and and so this was one of my favorite things in the book in some ways I thought of it as like a master key kind of sequence but um, now I'm almost not sure it belongs in the book at all it might actually be uh, it, it might not make the cut it might turn out to have been um, better as a subliminal you know just a in which case, this moment, if it doesn't make it in the book, will be a very rare and precious chaldron. No, oh, but I'm, sh <laughs> I'm, sh I'm shameless, and probably someone will ask me to for a something for a little magazine. And if it doesn't make it into the novel, I'll just put it in a little magazine. So it won't be that rare. But um, so uh, anyway, the book is um, about a kind of enigmatic uh, near future that's a, not a, a, a dystopia, nor is it a post-apocalyptic scenario. It's kind of a post something happened world. And it's, uh, I, I like to use the word atopia. It's not a utopia and it's not a dystopia. It's just a, a another situation. In some ways you could say it's a post collapse because some things have collapsed, but other things are the same and no one is sure, there's no comprehensive view of what this occurrence was. So this chapter, which is called I Am Trying to Describe Things I Don't Understand, is an account, a clumsy account, by my, as I said, one of my typical methodologies is to write from the point of view of the person who doesn't get it. So this is someone who doesn't get it, trying to talk about a, a change in the world that he's pretty sure most people don't get. So he's going to say what he knows about it. So I am trying to describe things I don't understand. Oh, and the, the change has been nicknamed by people at this time, or at least in his town, it's been nicknamed the arrest. So what he's describing to you is, you know, what is the arrest? How did it happen? Or, or what does it look like? Without warning except every warning possible, it had come, the arrest. Suddenly and in increments, parcels, microdoses, to which we'd been too delirious to attend. The collapse and partition and relocalization of everything. The future, that is, announced itself. The future always already present, only distributed unequally, like everything else, like bread, talent, sex, like peepal, neem, aloe, gerbera, and those other plants that give off oxygen at night, like the rare spotosol fervent soil for which my sister's farming collective was named. We stranded at last on the shore of the always arriving wave, let B be finale of seam. The arrest produced itself as a now already past, like a time capsule unearthed, one bigger on the inside than the outside, a time capsule into which we'd all climbed. Be patient with me. I'm trying to explain things I don't understand. Who'd say where it started? The question was when it gained your attention. Plenty flew under the radar. Biodiversity halved? That hadn't made a huge impression. Polar ice and refugees, too big to take personally. One day, we... You and I, anyway, noticed reports of a new tick-borne disease. This one, a novelty, like that asparagus ice cream you'd long ago sampled at the fair. Once bitten, your new superpower was that cow meat made your throat close up. No more American Wagyu tomahawk steak for two, black on the outside, red within. It made a fine thing to reminisce over, over mung bean sprouts or roadkill. <laughs> 
You joked, were the new ticks an eco-terrorist hack? Had those bent on saving us no more regard for our privacy, autonomy, comfort in worn personal routine, or hot internet dates than the ones bent on destroying us? Had they ever? Someone went on television and told us that the turning point had been when, in 1975, the president had worn a sweater on television and proposed solar panels on the White House and been ignored. For counterpoint, another someone then told us that the turning point had been when St. Paul's epistle had been delivered to the Romans and ignored. We weren't subject to many further such debates. Such debates were to suffer a mercy killing. It was at this moment that the arrest drew your attention, wasn't it? Be honest. You, your friends, like mine, sat up and noticed the death of screens. The screens, they died not all at once, but in droves, like the 6,000 avian flu victims in Irkutsk and Ghana, like the hundreds of manatees washing ashore the same day in Boca Grande, which you found somehow uncompelling, deleted from your feed. You unfriended the manatees. No hard feelings. I did too. Television died first. Television contracted a hemorrhagic ailment, Ebola or some other flesh-melting thing. The channels bled into one another, signals fusing across time as well as virtual space. A live Rod Serling Playhouse 90 teleplay broadcast from 1956, sputtering into last agonized life and expiring in the middle of episodes of season two of Big Little Lies. We had to deal with the Vietnam War coming back and Green Acres and Charlie Rose too until these boiled and seethed and melted along with the rest. Our Gmail, our texts and swipes and FaceTimes, our tweets and posts, these suffered colony collapse syndrome. Each messenger could no longer chart its route to the hive or returned only to languish in the hive, there to lose interest in its typical labors, whether worker or drone. All at once, our email quit producing honey. No honey? Oh, honey, where are you? Honey, I am here looking for you. This was, needless to say, a little problematic for those of us whose erotic lives, like mine, depended on the stuff. Problematic? Those lives all evaporated overnight. Worse, it turned out so many other ecosystems depended on the pollinations, the goings between of the now fatigued drones and workers. Without them, nothing worked. Air, condition, air conditioning units stalled, planes fell from the skies. The due considerations of the committee to solve the problem, you know which problem I mean, all of them, was unable to confer in its virtual location and further found itself summarily dissolved into a series of isolates, possibly unable to recognize one another in broad daylight, possibly unable even to recall their own individual names. The honey our email and texts had made had been the glue that held the world together, it now appeared. The computers all evidenced chronic traumatic encephalopathy, wasting disease. We sought to find the computers a level pasture and let them graze the last part of their lives and were heartbroken to see them crumbling to their knees or starving for the incapacity of grazing. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Or, I don't know, maybe I should stop soon. Um, I mean, just, I'll do a little bit from the latter part of this riff. Did someone cry? No! <laughs> Never stop! <laughs> Keep me here all night! Um, okay. Uh, I'll just go to this more summary part here. Was it a solar flare? Eco-terror? Terror terror? Species revenge? A revolution? The revolution? A judgment or a goof? Sell-by date on the Anthropocene? Had we simply jumped the shark? The stars didn't go out one by one. America wasn't replaced with a next thing, except in as it was replaced by where you were. The vicinity where you happened to dwell at the moment of the arrest, which had happened gradually until it happened suddenly, and which might only have occurred in the vicinity at which you happened to be, did they even call it the arrest elsewhere? But be done with such speculation. Be here now. Wherever you go, there you are. All politics are local. Every bumper sticker came true at once. <laughs> we were even finally able to visualize world peas. <laughs> the bumper stickers came true, even as the cars slumped sidelong from the roads to make way for other means of transit. Every gas tank somehow sugared by the same prankster. The gasoline turned to inedible syrup, like Bosco from a back pantry shelf. 
a thing that chocolated our engines, that inched from the pump nozzles like molten, flourless cake. Guns worked for months, nearly a year after the initial arrest, then died too, souring like milk. The bullets no longer even blew up if you shattered them with a hammer. Believe it, we tried. Goodbye to all that, to gasoline and bullets and to molten flourless cake. Goodbye to coffee. Coffee! To bananas and Rihanna. To Father John Misty. To Spotify. And solicitations from the American Association of Retired Persons. How old do they think I am? Goodbye to news feeds full of distant core meltdowns. Buried, trapped children. Refugee children falling into sinkholes or core meltdowns. To Marlena Dietrich retrospectives at Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center which might, for all we knew here, have been flooded with refugees or fallen into a sinkhole or suffered core meltdown, and anyhow, the entirety of which I'd, traded, I'd trade for one good cup of hot black Bolivia-Ethiopia blend. Hello instead to solar dehydrators, rooftop rain collectors, to corn, bean, kale, and winter squash. Say hello to winter squash jerky. <laughs> Say hello to composting toilets and humanure. Say hello to a killing cone feather plucker, and evisceration knife. Hello to chasing a screaming duck into a pond to drag it back to the killing cone. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's good. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So lastly, and with total permission to sneak out at any point, I would take questions from you patient friends of any any on any anything we just talked about or whatever whatever else I could help with. Personal finance. <laughs> I'm so good with that. Fashion. Hi. Yeah, is the future announcing itself now or is it just sneak up? <sighs> is the future <laughs> announcing itself now or is it just sneaking up on us? Well, I mean, it's this is a trick question, isn't it? Um, I do feel like, um, you know, reading uh, out of print, what were out of print Philip K. Dick and Barry Malsberg books in 1976, uh, watching old Twilight Zone episodes, um, and connecting those things with also just weird dusty information from the 1950s, like the things Lenny Bruce was talking about on those records that only I was playing, or uh, reading John Hershey's uh, Hiroshima, or, you know, or watching, like, film noir at the, uh, the, the Bleecker Street Cinema. It all had this weird information that now seems like the most urgent communique, and I... I don't feel like I have anything much um, that's um, helpful to say, but I do feel a little better prepared because th there's this weird frozenness to all the, you know, things that seem true in that post-war world that my parents' lives came out of. Um, the the All the issues that, like, you know, I mean, I just recently wrote this piece about Edward Snowden, and I couldn't get a handle on it until I started rereading Robert Sheckley's short stories from from Galaxy Magazine in 1957. And suddenly I was like, that's, that's what we're understanding now, is how to, how to read the science fiction stories from 1957. Because... Um, the, you know the 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 and you know what what ha what happened what, does that mean like Philip K Dick was some kind of Nostradamus not really he just felt afraid on the page he felt it he felt it in his body you know he just he just was worrying and and identifying with it and and hungry to to um, say what he was afraid of as 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 you know. Um, in a way that would, you know, be funny and make him feel better uh, and maybe make someone else um, be more afraid than he was. You know, if he could freak somebody else out, then maybe he wouldn't be so freaked out. It just was like in his body, that response. And it is very descriptive. It's amazing. I, I wonder. 
on Philip K. Dick if he if it wasn't prophetic in some way. Some of those descriptions are so exact, and I believe he was schizophrenic, um, and had assumed that some of his predictions were in fact true uh, himself, but also intensely fearful of them. But anytime I read Philip K. Dick, I think mm, maybe uh, he was visited uh, by Pink Laser. He 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 certainly tried to pin it to a lot of different you know he 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 wanted there to be an answer to why he uh, saw the world the way he did and um, he tried out a lot of um, you know a self-diagnosis and uh, and and world diagnosis you know he thought at one point that the the Holy Roman Empire was coming back and that or actually had never gone away <laughs> and it was just you know the all of contemporary reality was just a kind of weird scrim laid over the top of the persistence of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and, you know, the thing about uh, those sensations is that they, um, they, they, they help us understand to always be interpreting the, a next layer to reality, you know. Um, they're... they're um, you know, it's a it's a model for for being unsatisfied with uh, ideology, basically, and just even noticing how much of it there is. Hey, hi, Jonathan. How are you? Um, this is going to be a very strange question for you, but so um, my kids, I invited my kids to come see you. A lot of them were reluctant or couldn't afford the. Um, I wanted to, to ask if you could say hello to them for the Westinghouse kids. That would, and they also want to know if you're alive because <laughs> a lot of times they don't, you know, when they read something, they think that the writer is dead or they don't exist. And I'm like, yes, they exist. So I would, you know, do you mind saying hello to them? Not at all. Why don't I record a greeting to them, Marcos, at the end of this when, okay. when we're, we're yeah, off stage? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hey there. I'm sorry, I can't see especially well, so you guys have to self-elect and just talk, okay? Uh, hey, so I'm, I'm curious about the film uh, you know, that you talked about that I got in the mail. And the sound of what's going to be the mail is that I was just that age when it came out. <laughs> I know how you feel. <laughs> Mm, oh yeah. Which I just felt that you were making a sort of like-minded thing that that was a bit different. Um, so I just kind of wanted your thoughts if you wanted to tell them that about the film as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you several several versions of an a quick quickly uh, an account of this. I mean, so one thing is, I sent your you know b before he'd even come along, I'd had weird good luck with being optioned and not filmed. Already, my first four novels, the ones that precede Mother's Brooklyn, which was my fifth, had each been in some kind of development procedure and and really interesting experiences with uh, filmmakers who I admired. Some who were like um, uh, freaked me out how much they'd been involved in things I loved. So it was like a kind of reciprocity. Uh, um, uh, the Hampton Fancher, who who had uh, written Blade Runner was interested in my first novel, and David Lynch was interested in my second novel, and um, a little bit later on, David Cronenberg was interested in my third novel. So this was like incredibly gratifying. But I also had this sensation that, first of all, I wasn't being asked to be the filmmaker. I wasn't a director, I wasn't even a screenwriter, and nobody was presuming that I should become those things. And I had a feeling as a film goer that a lot of the films I liked that had some relationship to a book, um, what, it was an oblique connection. That, that they, were, they weren't uh, kind of pedantically faithful. That actually, uh, often they were really, um, they just took chunks of narrative or ideas or images and made whole other things out of them. And I liked that possibility that the book and the film could be two different artifacts that just have a charged relation one to the other. Um, like um, like the, the book would be like a dream the movie once had and is trying to remember or something. <laughs> and um, so I was already on the 
in a way, I was against the position that people projected for me, including the filmmakers often. They would often tiptoe very lightly up to this, you know, so we'd have to change a few things, and I'd say, great, just make a movie. Make something that's, like, awesome. And I don't need to know what you're changing. You don't have to vet it with me. And we'll just meet at the premiere, and that'll be really fun. Um, and I, I'd turn this into a, almost like a corny kind of spiel that I would roll out in that conversation to preempt their ticklish questions. You know, like it was it was exhausting to have to ha hold their hands and say, "Yes, it's okay if you change my book." So I just tried to be very uh, total about that, and that was true when when Edward Norton, uh, op, you know, through New Line Cinema optioned Motherless Brooklyn before it was even published. Uh, so this is really 20 years ago. Uh, he and I got into a conversation, the circumstances of which were very weird. We, we actually met at a courtside NBA game in Toronto. We were watching a Toronto Raptors game, and I was a, seated a few seats behind him. He had no idea I was in Toronto. And he was there shooting a, a comedy called Death to Smoochie. And, um, and I, so I walked up. I had really good seats, but of course his seats were a little better than mine. And I walked the, up the rows and annoyed all the rich people and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hi, I'm that guy. You optioned my book. And the, the next day, I had a conversation with Edward Norton in, a, um, uh, in his um, dressing room on the set of Death to Smoochie in Toronto. And that's when, you know, for better or worse, he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He said, I want to put this book in the 1950s so, for two reasons, so that it can be um, not uh, look ridiculous like these guys are playing dress up. Um, you know, he, he had this idea that I thought was pretty alert w idea that in, in my book, the characters can be acting like gumshoes or mobsters or kind of corny 1950s style film noir characters in contemporary Brooklyn. And because it's all done in language, you don't object. You can kind of transmit the two things together because of the matrix of language. But that if you film it, it becomes too literal. And it looks like these guys are just jerks on Halloween pretending to be good fellas, or, or even worse, it would look like the Blues Brothers or something. <laughs> so he wanted to protect it from that risk, but he also, he was obsessed with Robert Moses and the development history of New York City, and he saw that story as potentially being analogous to the way um, Roman Polanski's Chinatown uses, uh, and all of these signifiers were completely up and running for him already at this point. You know, 20 years later, that's the movie he, he made, was the one he described to me that day. And I did, I gave him my usual spiel. I said, it's yours, go make something that's not my book, and, and I'll be really interested to see what happens. Um, so now I have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's okay. I mean, I do, I do think that it really is better that there are two different artifacts, and they resonate in a peculiar way. The books don't film directly anyway. You, you can fall into the trap of thinking, oh, why didn't they just sh like shoot the book? But it doesn't really work that way. The interiority and the, just the language structures are not transmittable like that. Thanks. There was a, you, you had put some of your, I, I don't think you put them directly in the public domain, but there used to be a portion of your website <laughs> where you uh, had put a couple short stories up for people to yeah. interpret as they would. Is that still... Yeah, I'm I'm not I'm bad at upkeeping websites, so mm. it's in dis, it's in total disrepair. But the the principle is still there, and there are people who still come around and find them and make little short films out of them. But those are mostly um, pieces that would be impossible to make a whole feature film out of. They're mm. qu they're quite short stories. Right. The the thing I did around the same time was I gave away the rights to one of my novels instead of um, using agents and producers. I wanted to just have a filmmaker just come and approach me, and so I said, somebody come and take this book away and just have it for free. And um, that was with a, a, a kind of an outlier book in some ways, because it was in the middle of all my big New York books, I wrote one weird little romantic comedy set in Los Angeles called You Don't Love Me Yet. And, um, so and that's still, it, it's still, I've had to give it away three different times. <laughs> but the, the guy who's working on it now might, might make it. I think he has a chance of making a movie out of it's it. It's actually the only time I gave um, L.A. a chance. I was like, <laughs> oh, well, all right. I'll read an L.A. book. Um, great. That was my addition yeah. to that. So there's somebody else in this. I think there was a over there, over there here. in glasses. Hi. Oh, 
Well, I, you know, it's so, it's so much the replenishing source of writing. It seems so essential to me. I'm, so I'm always reading a lot of things when I write. I mean, some of it is, some of my reading life is involuntary now because I have students who, I mean, I was just saying, one of them just dropped a 600-page novel on my desk. It was an undergraduate, and I think he wrote it over the summer. And um, so I read a lot of pages of, of um, apprentice writing, which is a very stimulating and stultifying kind of reading to do that, that mixes me up in interesting ways and, and, and over-nourishes my sense of uh, writing as a kind of permanent area of crisis. Um, <laughs> And and then I, r I go running for like really sturdy, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, things that are you know I often read a lot of I like to read older books because um, things that are are kind of um, out of print or or classics if they're older I feel it takes me out of the world of kind of hype and publishing and chatter and it's more it's more just me and the book and I also read the books I'm teaching. So then there are certain texts I read over and over again. And that's, re that's really uh, interesting, too. But I also read, I read for pleasure, and I grab things, and I try them out. And I don't, I don't finish as many of the books I start as I used to. Um, and that, that's some of that's damaged attention span, and some of that's maybe also realizing I'm not going to live as long. I used to think I would just read every novel that there ever was. And so, of course, I'd read them all to the end, because I, I was going to live long enough to read them all. Now I think about the one I might be reading sometimes when I'm reading one that's not totally happening for me. I brought along um, Anna Burns' Milkman on the plane this morning, um, or whatever that was, late last night in L.A., in LAX, and I read a couple of chapters of that, and, and I, I think I'll stick with it. Um, thanks for the question. I guess, yeah, one or two more. Hi. Any of it to your Michael Seidenberg syllabus of your career? Well, sure. I mean, in in one really pure sense, my whole reading life, not just a syllabus, is is a conversation that I, you know, I didn't, you know, began with my mother's bookshelves, but it sw switched to to Michael almost being a kind of central interlocutor of like, what are you reading and what's what are you excited about next, and you know, the preeminence of excitement of response not some agenda or c categorical space but you know i mean um one of the things i was proudest of was that even as a kid i could get michael to read something if i really told him it was great and i got him into philip k dick you know when i was this is like a teenage boy talking to a very opinionated if you knew michael you know very opinionated uh sardonic sometimes very impatient reader with a lot of big favorites who thought of himself as not liking science fiction. So the outward look of those books was like, you know, a turnoff to him. He didn't have any science fiction he liked. And I just got him to do it. And then he became obsessed. And that was how, you know, that was why he and Paul Nelson had started hanging out before I even walked in was because that name came up. So the passion, just finding something and it, it's overwhelmingly it's 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 like written for you. It's it's the thing you need to read and you need to talk about with someone else as as urgently as possible. And that's the best way to do it. Syllabus, of course. You know there are stumbles. There are things I I reassign on memory and then I reread them and I'm I'm not I'm not there. And there are things I I I assign that I really think are like oh my god the most irrepressibly joyful. Uh, you know, writer, just who everyone would love. Like I put a, a Italo Calvino book on a syllabus recently, thinking it was the like, the dessert. There were some difficult things, but that's the one they're going to love, and they're going to be so grateful that I introduced them to Italo Calvino. And they they kind of humbled me. They they really broke it apart, and they were like, we don't want to be in this dude's head. We don't like him. <laughs> and I was really startled because I just thought of him as such a, um, Which book? Which one? if on a winter's night of traveling. Um, um, yeah, we could talk about it. It's an interesting problem. What happened with that book in my in my course? But but yeah, I mean, I, there's no better place for me to start than with you know. And I often think that if in a given room on a given you know uh, 
when I roll out a syllabus or I'm assigning the books, I'm talking about what we're going to do. If I think at the end of that, it's so brief. It's such a brief encounter, really. Three months, it's gone like this. If one of them has a book that they'll think about the rest of them, their lives, one of the 15 or 18 people just is like, you know, like, oh, my God. I read, you know, Del I read Samuel Delaney's Dahlgren in college. This crazy-ass professor made me do it, and now I just – I would never have thought about that book, and now I'll never forget that book. And if that happens to one of, of the 15 or 18 students in that room, I've, I, I've done a thing. You know? That's okay. Great. Um, Are there any others? Well, I guess. It's a good time to let you go. It's a good time, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. Might be time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Like a, a yes. yeah. There is no more good water because it's pond is dry.